Hi everyone, how are you? Hope you're doing well this Friday afternoon UK time, whatever time it is, wherever you are in the world. Um, my name's Carl, welcome to this webinar um, on behalf of the TEFL org, where I'm going to talk a bit about TEFL CVs or resumes, depending on what you call them. I'm going to talk a little bit about what to put in your resume, a little bit about sort of how it should look, that kind of thing. So if that's the sort of thing you're interested in, this is the webinar for you. Um, please say hello and let me know where you are in the world. Um, I'm in Northern Ireland. Here I work as an online TEFL teacher straight after this webinar. I've got a a, an hour and a half long lesson with a student. Um, so I work as an online teacher. I also work as a um, teacher trainer. So if you do any practical courses with us at the TEFL org in Northern Ireland or, or sometimes in the Republic of Ireland, you might have me for the weekend. Um, I also work as a TEFL examiner. Um, I've, and I used to work a lot abroad before COVID on that. A lot of that's now online. Um, I have lived in China, Vietnam, lived and taught in China, Vietnam, Thailand. I've managed schools in lots of places around the world. I've lived in Iraq, Azerbaijan, Spain, Italy teaching. So I've also worked in lots of places around the world. Um, so if you've got any questions at all about TEFL, I mean, ideally around CVs and resumes, because that's what we're going to be talking about mainly today. But if you've got any other questions, like you want to know how to get into becoming a teacher, maybe you're already teaching, you've got a specific question, I will try my best to answer it. If I can't, Alan, who's monitoring the chat, will put a link in there, which might be able to help you as well. So hello, everyone. I can see the hellos coming in. Rachel in Colorado, hiya. Um, Mr. Hinto in Toronto, lots of hellos from lots of other people. Donna in Florida. Arganti, did I say that right? In Berlin, hiya. Brian in Canada. Uh, John in Richmond, Germany. Orem, South Africa. Colombia, Oxford. Sandra, I was born near Oxford. Um, Emmy in Egypt. Yeah, loads of people. Great to see where you're all from. Right, let me get going with this presentation. And once I've, um, as I said, if you've got, but if you've got any questions, put them in the chat as we're going along, okay? And if I if I think they're relevant to the time, I'll answer them. If not, at the end of it, I will answer them. And it's going to take about an hour to get through the presentation and and all the questions. Okay. So, TEFL CVs resumes, they're, they're similar. I, I, you know, I think some people call them resumes. I think generally Americans call them that uh, in the UK. And I think in a big part of Europe, we call them CVs. I don't know what you tend to call it. Put it in the chat what you tend to call them. Um, but that they're pretty much the same thing. Now, I've, as I said, I've managed schools before. So I've I've dealt with the hiring process of teachers. So that, as in I've made the advert, I've published the advert and I've dealt with the applications that come in. I've done the interviews, I've done the shortlist and all that kind of thing. So I hope I've got a bit of an idea about this. But of course, if you disagree, please do put it in the chat. I like it when people disagree with me sometimes. Right, so first of all, I'll talk a little bit about the TEFL application process, okay? So um, one thing I would say is you will see similar roughly ideas around, okay? But it does sort of vary by country and within that country it can vary by company. And the reason it can vary is that some countries have a different way of applying for jobs where where they are than you might have in your country, wherever you're from. OK, so um, it does vary that. And then within a country, you might have, for example, an American running a language school that wants to do the uh, recruitment in a sort of a, an American way, let's say. Or you might have a local person, let's say a Chinese person who really wants to do it in a sort of Chinese way. So culturally, it's slightly different, but generally the process is right. It might be that the stages are slightly different. OK, so the one thing that I, I think you always have to do, and I think you'll see in most of the adverts, is you need to send in a CV. I'm going to call it a CV from now on because that's what I call it. So you don't you tend to always need to send in a CV. OK, you also might need to, though, and this annoys me, but it's what companies do. You also might need to send in an application form. Now, I have worked for companies where they say, please send us your CV and they don't look at your CV. They only look at the application form. Annoying. 
However, I've also worked for companies where they look at the CV and the, the application form as well. OK, so just, you know, that's, that's something that to be aware of and think about. You might also need to do and this is depends. This is if you're working online or working for in in face to face in a country, you might need to do an intro video. So it's something to be aware of that you might need to do that as well. Um, then there will be some sort of interview where they talk a bit about your CV application form, that kind of thing, and some of the questions that they have. All right. So that tends to be the application process for getting a TEFL job either online or face to face somewhere. OK. Now, the first thing which tends to go right at the top of a TEFL CV is personal information. That's what I've got at the top of my CV. OK. And it can be quite normal in an applicate in the job advert for them to ask you a little bit about what to put in the personal information i've seen that in a few times okay it's also quite um normal in countries to ask personal questions of you in the interviews so i tend to just put it in the the cv i don't really have a problem with sort of putting my personal information in so I do actually put my marital status in the CV. Now, I'm not saying you have to do that, but what you um, what you have to be prepared for is then to talk about it maybe in the interview. It's something that does come up in TEFL interviews, okay? And the reason why, especially if you're going to go work abroad, this is, the reason they want to know your marriage status, or because I'm married, I've got a daughter, why would I be, I, you know, if I'm going to go abroad, I would also be bringing them with me. And that would that would sort of maybe cause issues for the company in terms of the number of visas they have to give out. Do they have to help me with schooling for my daughter? That kind of thing. So I tend to put that if I'm especially because I'm married, I put that at the top. OK, I put my age at the top and you might think, well, why do I need to put my age? You know, are they going to discriminate? But the, the, the reason being is because some company, some countries have an upper limit on the visa. And if they um, if you're over the limit, not because the company says that, but because the country, the government of that country says there's an upper limit. It, it, you don't want to waste their time by because you won't be able to get a visa. OK, I also put my first language. OK, um, I put my first language at the top. Um uh, if I'm I, what I would suggest to people that are non native speakers there, I would put my say your first language is um, Polish. Fine. I would also put on there and my English language ability. So I would put something like C1 level certified in English, whatever it might be. OK, I would put my English language at the top. My second language ability is so bad that I don't bother putting it at the top there. But if you are really good at speaking Spanish or French or whatever it might be, I would also put that probably up the top there. I would also put my citizenship as in what passport I have. Again, not to be discriminatory, but again, it's the visa process. Countries have certain um, other countries that it's just easier to get through the visa process. So I would put my citizenship up there. OK, if you don't put your citizenship up, you, you're probably going to get asked that in an interview. OK, or well, probably even before that, you'll probably get an email asking that. Um, just on that note, it is very common whilst you're doing this to send a photocopy, a picture of your passport. Pretty much every job I've ever done has, has, has asked this and I have no problem doing that. Um, now. I do put a photo at the top of my CV. Now, I don't think that's very common in the UK. I don't know if it's common in your country, but I do tend to have a photo where I've got the side on looking like that with a tie and a shirt on. I've got I've got that up there because they want to see it. The reason being is because they want to check if you if you if you're a man, they want to check that you can look quite smart you haven't got sort of long hair that comes all everywhere um they want to check if you've uh, haven't got any sort of facial piercings and that kind of thing not because they discriminate against it but sh some students don't really like that so i would put that in as a uh, as a personal just to look just to look professional okay um right so then you might put something like a profile next so you give a summary of yourself so i would say something like a uh, 
master's level TEFL certified teacher who has been teaching for 20 years to various different levels in various different countries. Something like that. So just sort of a one or two sentence. Try and be a bit human about it. Try and be a bit nice about it. You know, just sort of describe yourself as a person, that kind of thing. Um, yeah, I think in the profile very quickly, if you've got like three or four sentences, you could highlight your skills. Known for his friendly manner. Known for my friendly manner, something like that I would put. Um, and, and, and that kind of thing, all right? If you don't have any teaching experience because you're new to teaching, you might want to put something there about customer facing. So you might want to say um, a newly qualified TEFL teacher who has 10 years experience of working in a customer role dealing with um, sales, complaints, whatever it might be. Something like that, I would do that. Again, if you've not got much experience there, I'd put something like computers, especially if you're going for online jobs, something like this. Uh, again, if you've not really got any sort of customer facing roles, if you've not got any computer skills, I'd put something like languages up there if I was newly qualified. Um, you know, speaks uh, Spanish to C1 level, something like that. Then you might also in that three or four sentences might want to sort of highlight the related qualifications you have. So I've got a master's qualification. I would highlight that. If you've got any added on modules from one of our courses, I would highlight that, that kind of thing. Um, obviously put your TEFL qualification. That's really key. I'd really, as a recruiter, want to see that. Okay. And then if you've got, if you're a non-native speaker, maybe in the profile, the, the little sentence about you, I would put something like, um, has an IELTS certificate with eight overall, has a Trinity certificate to level 10, level 11, whatever it might be, whichever one you've taken, just to show that you've got a good level of English. Okay. Yeah. Short little three or four line paragraph, I think is enough there. Okay. Then you go into your qualifications. So always start with your TEFL certificate. Even if you are so proud of your degree, always start with your TEFL certificate because you're going for a TEFL job. Okay. Now that tends to tends to also be the most recent qualification you've done. So I think you know that tends to work pretty well. So start with your TEFL certificate. State the name of the company that you got your TEFL certificate from. Now we here at the TEFL org, T-E-F-L dot O-R-G, do TEFL certificates. You can take a course with us, you can get a TEFL certificate. However, we know that there are other companies out there. And you know, you might not do your course with us, fine, but it's really important that you put the name of the, um, the, the, com the, the company, so recruiters can check the accreditation level of your certificate. So if I get two people who've both got TEFL certificates and you know they're pretty much similar else in terms of experience, that kind of thing, I would Google definitely the two companies to see if, to make sure that your TEFL certificate was of a good quality and is legitimate. I'd also put the date you did it. I would also put any modules that you covered. So you know, covered English grammar, communicative, communicative teaching, whatever it might be. The number of hours you studied, you can get that from the TEFL provider. Um, and also if you've done any practical components, I would also put that on there as well. So did a weekend course in, uh, did a weekend course where I delivered to assess lessons, something like that, okay? Then I would put my degree if it's relevant, yeah, okay, as, as in some, if you've got a degree, put it on there. What I meant if relevant is if you haven't got a degree, that's fine. There are jobs out there for people without degrees. But if you've got a degree, put it on there, okay? Um, I'd put the dates that I studied, I put my final grade. Now here, I try and put some relevant modules to TEFL. So it might be different, you might have done a degree in, um, biochemistry you might think that there's not any relevant modules but sort of think there did you deliver any presentations that's part of teaching did you do any group work that kind of thing i might put that on there if you're sort of thinking about what you could do to do with tefl anything where you had to use your voice a bit really 
Um, then I'd go into school qualifications. Now, if you're a non-native speaker, state the English exams you have completed in this bit, in the qualifications. I would, you know, if you've got a degree, I'd put it after the degree before the school qualifications. Now, what you might want to do is put this, your score for each skill, listening, reading, writing, speaking, sort of thing like that. You might, if you've done multiple English qualifications, you might want to list them all there. Okay, definitely get them up there in the qualifications. Then I would go into a section on work experience. So we've got the profile, we've got qualifications now on work experience. Um, state all your jobs you've ever done. Okay, now what you might find is that some you really are either a long time ago, if you're of a mature age, or if you've um, not really got, uh, or if you didn't stay there that long, you might find that those just have a couple of lines. But I, for the most recent one, do it in chronological order. So most recent, then go back. But you should also account for any missing periods there. All right. So if you went and studied, you know, put 2005, 2008, studied my degree. Um, uh, 2019, traveled around Europe, something like that. Although I don't think anyone was traveling around Europe. No, that was a year before COVID, wasn't it? Yeah. Um, so yeah, travel breaks are important. If you did go on any travel breaks, I would sort of list your countries there. I'm not talking if you went on a one week holiday with your mum to Goa. Yeah, I'm talking sort of if you go on like a long holiday, all right? Um, now, don't think you have no experience. Yes, TEFL recruiters understand that some people come to TEFL later in life or they are coming straight from their degree and they may not have worked that much. Don't think though that you have no experience at all. If you've done any sort of job, I bet you've got some relevant experience. So think about any sort of customer interactions you might have had. So did you, as I said a bit earlier, did you have to deal face to face taking orders, answering the phone, doing Zoom calls, um, that kind of thing, or were you in a shop selling things? That shows the recruiter that you can use your voice and you're happy speaking publicly a little bit. OK, so that kind of thing, I think, is very relevant for a CV um, on in your jobs. Did you attend any training courses? Because just we learn as much from attending. You know, I think when I'm teaching, I think about all the bad teachers I had before. And I think of all the good teachers I had before. And I try and bring that into my own teaching. And if you can say that we I might have nothing to do with TEFL, but if you did any sort of training courses in that job, fantastic. Did you ever even better? train someone up so did you show someone how to use the tills did you show someone how to enter some things on a certain software piece something like that that's all relevant that's all sort of teaching okay any presentations you gave all right uh, again recruiters like that sort of thing any sort of business skills look good to employers so if you you know even if you did a little bit of marketing that kind of thing that might help you to teach business English, um, which companies like people teaching business English because they tend to make a bit more money out of it. Um, you know, did you um, do any sort of sales? I said, did you reply to emails? Something like that. Again, it shows sort of that you've got the writing skills, that kind of thing. All right. Um, now, if you've got no work experience at all, if you've got zip, if you have never worked a day in your life because you're either too young or you, you won the lottery and you've spent all your money. Um, if you've got no work experience, then the qualifications might need expanding. OK, so again, as I said, in your in your school, did you give any presentations? Did you do any group work? That kind of thing in your degree, even any team projects that you worked on? I would sort of highlight that a bit about my CV. Have you got what, what computer skills have you got? Obviously, that's great for teaching online, but it's also quite important for designing worksheets to use in the classroom, uh, for making PowerPoints that you might do in on your big screen in the classroom, that kind of thing. Any computer skills you got. Uh, obviously, if you've got good grades, highlight them a bit, you know, make sure that you, you put them in there. OK, um, then if you've if you've sort of work experience, maybe start to think about listing a bit more information in your hobbies. 
Uh, anything that's relevant. So, you know, I love playing golf. How relevant is that to teaching? I'm not so sure. But, you know, I like reading travel books. You can see my collection of Lonely Planets at the top here. That might sort of be something that's a bit more relevant, you know, getting that kind of thing in. OK, uh, you know, anything that you do in your hobbies where you communicate as well is fantastic. So if you play football, you know, talk a bit about the communication skills that you use when you play football. Um, you know, if you if you're in a if you're on Facebook and you like doing uh, group chats where you discuss stuff, that's the sort of thing that you could put in as a communication. OK, uh, literature always goes down well. OK, so be a bit careful. Don't just say I like reading, sort of say a bit more about what you like reading. OK, you know, recruiters tend to like that sort of thing. If you're going for a TEFL job where you're working fully online, yeah, um, technical skills are important. It's, it's, you know, if, if you're recruiting people to come and teach on your online platform, you want to know that the problem is going to be with the newly employed teacher. The problem is going to be if any, if there's going to be any problem, the problem is going to be that maybe their teaching isn't up to good because that can be sort of you know, that's new. That's we sort of know that's going to happen with newly qualified teachers. Yeah. What you don't really want as a recruiter is to be is to be like, oh, no, I've got to show this person how to send emails. Believe it or not, that's true. I've had to deal with that before. Uh, oh, no, we've got to show this person how to make a PowerPoint, whatever it might be. That is quite time consuming. Yeah. So if you've got any technical skills and you're working fully online, I put a little section in my CV for that. OK, a list of programs you are technical at, the office suite, whatever it might be. Um, you know, if you're good at sort of uh, using uh, DaVinci to make video edits, that kind of thing, put it in there. All right. Um, stuff that you're good at on a PC or a Mac. Yeah. I don't think recruiters tend to care how much you've got on how good you are on sort of mobile phones, to be honest. All right. So that sort of thing, programs you're good at. Uh, also, maybe explain your experiences remote working during COVID. Did you work a lot on Zoom? Um, did you either learn through Zoom, uh, Teams, whatever it might be, that kind of thing's fantastic. We love that, right? Um, also, the kind of thing that I would get on my CV there is that I, I, that you would put a little line in your technical expertise about teaching from a dedicated space. Now, my desk is very messy today. I'm not going to show you it. But this room is a dedicated TEFL room. I'm not going to have my mum walking past behind me, mainly because she doesn't live here. So that would be a bit strange. But I'm not I'm not going to have my dog come jumping in on my lap. It's happened before, but I tried to make it not happen. Um, because this is a dedicated sort of TEFL room and employers like that. OK. Um, right. So any pitfalls with CVs, okay? Avoid it being too long. I personally hate CVs that are four or five pages long, all right? I don't really tend to go past the first two pages. Yeah, you know, uh, if you can't fit it all into two paces, you might think I'm an expert. You know, I've got my CV is 47 pages long. I'm so brilliant. They ain't gonna read it. And, you know, it, it shows that you're not actually not a very good writer in a way because you can't talk concisely. Good part of being a good teacher is to to talk concisely, that kind of thing. So avoid it. Don't be too long. All right. Avoid too many empty statements. They drive, I think, people generally a bit mad. I'm a strong communicator. Are you good? What, what does that mean? You know, does that mean that you you talk over everyone? Uh, you know, what, what are, are you quite loud? What does it really mean? OK, and I'd want experience. That's what I sort of said, you know, successfully delivered presentations on this module in my degree. Uh, that kind of thing is, is much better inside your CV, inside the qualifications than just openly saying you're a strong communicator. You've got strong interpersonal skills. What does that mean? I, I, I've never really got that. You know, surely everybody, sh if you want to be a teacher, you've got to have strong interpersonal skills, haven't you? Uh, you're an efficient and reliable worker. Well done. Good for, good for you. I'm pretty sure most people are efficient and reliable workers. So extremely organized. Oh, oh, that's good. Actually, yeah, I hadn't thought about that. I want to employ an organized individual. 
Yeah. Oh, wait there. This CV says someone's disorganized, so I won't have them. You know, again, it's not the sort of thing that that we really care about. You know, put it, put, you know, these are the sort of things that should become naturally. Uh, positive personality. I, I, that's really good because I was really thinking about employing some miserable people for my job where they have to spend time with students all the time. Yeah, thanks for saying that. So, you know, just be careful of these kind of things, all right? The other thing that drives me mad is, is terrible looking documents. So by that, I'm sort of saying where people have used the same font all the way through. There's bad paragraphing. They haven't done anything at all with the layout, that kind of thing, because what they don't do, what happens is that, um, what happens is that uh, you've got to make worksheets for students. You will have to make a worksheet for student. It's got to look nice. If you put a worksheet down in front of a student and it doesn't, it doesn't look nice, the students aren't going to really care so much about it. So we want things to look nice. Okay. Um, so just a, just a few more. Just no grammar and spelling mistakes. You're going for a TEFL job. You've got to have a good level of English to do that. Get someone to check your grammar. Get someone to check your spelling for sure. Yeah. Um, make sure that, uh, uh, you know, that everything is perfect on that because I've had CVs before where people have given me bad grammar and spelling mistakes. Should I allow them in front of a classroom to teach grammar? I don't think so. A two page maximum, I think, really. If you've really got to go onto a third page, then go to it. But I think two pages maximum is fine. Learn to use the headings on Microsoft Word or, or on um, Google Doc, whatever it is you use to word process. Um, you know, there's little sections at the top, uh, subheadings, that kind of thing. Get a few of them in. You'd be surprised how easily that can be done to make it look nicely. Uh, also check the formatting when printed. Used to be a big problem where something would look on the screen quite nice, but when you printed it, it wasn't, it didn't look nice. Believe it or not, there's still quite a few people that print off the CVs of the people they shortlist. And if when it's printed, it doesn't look very nice, that, that, that's a, you know, that's an issue. Okay. Give it a good file name. If they want you to send the CV to them via email, don't call your file name cv.doc. Oh my word. Can you imagine if you've put an advert up there and you've got a hundred people applying and they've all sent their file name as cv.doc and you've got all of those on your computer and you've got to actually go into each one and individually rename it, that would drive, drive it's just mad. Okay, so do that, all right? Um, give the employer what they want. So if they, um, if they say list two references, list two references, if they say, want to hear about your English qualifications, list your English qualifications, that kind of things. All right. So just, just kind of things, just, you know, if they put that in the advert, put it in your CV. Okay. That does mean you might need to put stuff in that you don't necessarily feel natural doing, or you've got to put some things in that aren't what you would put in your country on a CV. It doesn't really matter. Put it in there. Okay. Uh, right, some final thoughts. LinkedIn can add a bit of weight to your CV. So I would have a LinkedIn um, page, okay? Especially if you've got a, a big chunk of previous work experience that maybe has nothing to do with TEFL. See if you can get some people to do some recommendations for you that I really think that looks nice. You know, if someone takes the time to recommend you on LinkedIn, even if it's got nothing to do with TEFL. You might want to put your LinkedIn um, uh uh, uh, address, you know, the web address on your CV, maybe at the top in the personal information, that kind of thing. So if you, if you have some sort of LinkedIn, I think it can add weight. All right. I, if I've shortlisted people after I've shortlisted them, I then Google them. I do. I make sure because I want to know if there's people saying if there's lots of people saying bad things about that person online from previous companies or something like that. I don't really care about your profile picture, that kind of thing on Facebook or whether you're on Toctic. I don't really care. Uh, 
I don't know what TikTok is. Um, you you will be Googled, I think. So just be aware of anything that comes up in your Google stuff. OK, uh, check your social media settings. All right. Um, now, if you are if you did one of our qualifications with us here at the TEFL org and you want a bit of help with your CV, we can do that. If you did one of our qualifications, send us a message, that kind of thing. We can definitely help you with that sort of thing. All right. That's if you're one of our students um, and we can help you check your CV before sending it. OK, um, good. Right. Now I'm going to get to some questions. Thank you very much for staying with me. Uh, one thing I would say is that on our website, tefl.org, there's some information about um, CVs. I'm sure Alan's put that in the chat already for us somewhere. Uh, right. Oh, oh, let me scroll through all the hellos. Hello, everyone. Argentina. Someone's in Argentina. Oh, I'm very jealous. Uh, LA, India. Loads here. Resume CVs. OK, good. Right. There we go. Um, is that someone offering me a job? I think it is. I'm OK. Thank you. I don't really need a job. Uh, right. First question. Uh, Dave. Hello. Dave T. You're working through your TEF 120 hour course. Good. I hope you're enjoying it. Uh, corporate IT. Lovely. Lovely. Um, right. So CV to highlight language skills from an inexperienced teacher. Right. A couple of things that I would say there is that you would be I if I was a school and I was recruiting teachers and I had some business English positions or I had even just a, say if I'm going to recruit a teacher for 24 hours lessons a week and I've got maybe five hours of business English. Dave T, I'd, I'd love that. I, w I think you'd be fantastic with corporate IT, especially sales. You'd be fantastic. You'd, you'd, that would really be a highlight for me. Now, I the language skills one. OK, when I my first ever TEFL job was in Vietnam. And I came straight off my quali my degree qualification, applied, got my job in Vietnam, went straight to my job in Vietnam. I had and still pretty much don't have any language skills. Yeah, you don't need them to TEFL. You just need English. That's all you need, Dave. OK, so if you've I don't know, like I highlighted that I've got a German GCSE, but don't ask me a question in German. You know, I wouldn't be able to answer it. So I don't think you need to worry too much about being in, in ex, uh, you're having a lack of language skills. However, Dave, I might be I might be reading that wrong. And if you have got good language skills, I'd put that up there to sort of definitely in the qualifications. You've got to be able to prove it. You can't just say I'm a intermediate German speaker. They would the, the you know, unless there's some sort of qualification to go alongside that, it's sort of an empty comment really Dave all right so that's just what I would I would do I put it up in my qualifications if I was really really advanced I might even put it in my profile okay um, even if you're applying for a country where you don't have any language skills so for example you've got German to advanced level but you're not going to go teach in Germany it does show that you've got a good understanding of grammar vocabulary that kind of thing all right good luck Dave uh, Karen hello um, good morning. So you're out west, I think, for me. Are uh, you interested in finding work in the business and medical English sectors? Right. Interesting one. So you let's deal with business first. You will find jobs advertised with us on our TEFL job section or on other job websites such as ESLcafe.com, not affiliated to us where they actually want full time business English teachers. That is something that you've put that you will see. OK, fantastic. If that's what you want to go down, Karen, go for it. Um, medical English, you don't tend to see jobs being advertised full on for medical English. All right. Mainly because there's not the big market out there as much as there is for business English. What you might find is that you get employed by a company for they want someone with medical English. But within your 24 hours, 25 hours that you're going to be working for them, you might only be teaching medical English three or four hours. 
what I would look for is on a website where you can sort of do a control F on the keyboard and search for medical. See if you, anything comes up. The other thing for you to look at, Karen, is to be an OET, Occupational English Test, I think is what it's called. Uh, OET teacher. So that is a specific exam that is for medical English. You might see some jobs advertised for that but there's not a huge amount out there. Business English is more your way for it, okay? Just, you know, just if, what I would say is a very off, it's very rare, apart from maybe in Japan, it's very, very rare to just get a full-time job only teaching business English. You tend to, every time I've taught business English has been I've taught general English and business English. Okay, all right. Uh, Kaylee. Um, good luck, Karen. Sorry. Uh, what if you have a degree in T? So, all right, show off. OK, um, then I would I would still put your teaching depends on your degree in TESOL because some degrees in TESOL. Anyone reading this TESOL and TEFL are, are basically the same. OK, um, there's slight differences, but in the UK, we tend to call it TEFL Americans and North Americans tend to call it TESOL, okay? Um, if you did a practical element to that, Kaylee, then you might not need to do another TEFL certificate. If you didn't do a practical element in it, uh, I would still go and do a TEFL course, okay? You might even find that you only need to do the, uh, the practical element of it, okay? I think I would put that in my profile, for sure right at the top um uh, and i would but i would still go with in qualifications my tefl certificate then my degree in tesol okay um pauline hello do you write the introduction statement in first or third person vernacular i prefer the third person way yeah um but i've also read nice ones that are in the first person i don't think it really matters too much if you're going to do it in the first person, then, you know, don't make it too uh, colloquial. I think first person tends to make you look a bit more human, um, whereas the third person seems to, to be also fine. I think as long as you do it right, I think that's all that matters. But probably third person, generally. OK. Um, Iris, hello. Hello from Slovenia. As a non-native speaker, should I take some exams to prove my level of English? If so, which do you recommend? Is it a must? Like, it's not a must. Well, it, it definitely helps. I have had, for example, I worked in Azerbaijan and I, I dealt with a lot of recruiting in Azerbaijan. Had a lot of non-native speakers applying for jobs whose English was much better than any level of foreign language I will ever get to. I've tried Japanese, I've tried Spanish. I've never really got above sort of pre-intermediate level. So their English was good. However, it wasn't necessarily really, really, really good. Okay. So I think if, if someone has that exam, then I think it helps. Now, one thing I would say to you, Iris, is you might find that even if you go do an IELTS test and you get nine overall, which is the maximum mark, you might find that there are still countries out there that won't take you on because you have a Slovenian passport. The passport that you're holding is as much to do as with your English ability. OK, not because the companies, because the countries. I've done webinars on teaching as a non-native speaker. I think have a look at that. But. What I would suggest is, even if you do something that's one of the cheaper tests, such as a Duolingo test, I think that would be, I would think that would be fine. I don't think you need to pay out for an IELTS test, which can be maybe a little bit expensive. You know, just find sort of a basic. But if you, the other thing to say is, if you did your degree in an English speaking university, that tends to count. Yeah. If you did your degree at a Slovenian sp sp speaking uh, um university that might not count so much okay i hope that answers your question iris yeah uh ll should you put your cv experience as cabin crew 
Would that be right? Yes, for sure. Dealing with annoying customers. Um, smiling all the time. A lot of teaching is about smiling all the time. Even when someone gives you a stupid answer, you're still smiling. Oh, really? Yeah, that's really good. Yeah, well, yeah, well done. You know, um, I'm being, I'm generalizing cabin crew there, aren't I? Uh, you know, you have to deal with children in cabin crew. You have to deal with adults, different nationalities. Whack that in, LL. Uh, Mr. Hintu. Hello. Uh, familiarity with different course management systems. Yes, put that in there. They love that, especially university jobs. If you've used Moodle, Blackboard, Canvas, uh, Google Education, is that what it's called? Uh, yeah, anything like that you've put in there, definitely, that's good, especially with adults and um, uh, university jobs. They love that kind of thing, Miss Hindu. Definitely put that in there. With You could do that in your technical expertise section. Um, you could do it in your job experience section. You could do it in your qualifications if that's how you learn. I did my master's through Blackboard, you know, never went to a single lecture. Good luck. Uh, Iris, um, should the experience part of your CV be detailed in describing or should it be concise, matter of fact? So if it's teaching experience, I think it needs to be a, a bit detailed. How I've got mine is uh job title name of company dates and then underneath i've got bullet points so for each job i've got that basically if it's not a very relevant job or if it was a long time ago because my first teaching job was almost 20 years ago now i i just do a couple of bullet points however my more recent teaching jobs i i put you know i go into a bit of detail for that kind of thing yeah for sure yeah if you've not got any teaching experience, as I said earlier, just highlight anything you've done that's customer facing, training, presentations, anything like that. OK. Uh, Elizabeth, hi. How are you? Hope you're doing well. Elizabeth's one of our regulars at tune in. Uh, do I recommend including references? Right. So I look, I, I think that what, what I do is at the bottom, I have a section saying references available upon request. That's what I do. The reason why is because I used to put in some references for uh, universities and people would, the companies I would apply for, believe it or not, they would contact the referees and not want to talk about me. They'd sort of contact them to try and do business with them and stuff like that. So that sort of drove me a bit mad. So I stopped doing that. However, I know that lots of people do. And I think if you're comfortable putting the names and the email address of previous employers, university lecturers, whatever it might be, then I think go for it. Me, myself, that really annoyed me. So I stopped doing it. OK, eventually you're going to have to give out references. All right. Eventually you're going to have to give out references. So it's up to you. OK. Um, uh, Sam, hi. Uh, regarding the pic I put in my CV and related pics, did I have facial hair in those? Well, look, I haven't got any facial hair up. I haven't got any hair up here, Sam. That, so that's my number one problem. Although I did in my first teaching job have hair down to there. So it's fallen off. Teffel has done that to me. Um, right. When I, I don't, I look terrible with no hair up here and no hair here. I have it a bit shorter than this. Okay. Um, but, you know, I, I think... I definitely would tidy it up a bit. Now you're making me vain about my hair, Sam. Um, I would make it a little, you know, I would, yes. If you regularly have a beard, why am I beating around the bush? If you regularly have a beard, put a photo up of a beard. Just be aware, if you've got the full on Father Christmas, there are cultural things like tattoos in Japan. If you've got any tattoos on show, you're not going to get much work in Japan. Okay. Um, there are countries that also have a problem with people having long beards. All right. So I would, if it was neat and tidy, I think if you're wearing a shirt and tie with it, you can get away with it a bit more. Sam. definitely spoke about beards for longer than I wanted to. Good luck, Sam. Uh, Roxana, hello. How to highlight English specialisms, niche, well in your CV. For example, you're a non-native speaker who works as a police constable in the UK. Wow. An intern at CEPO, and I suppose I think wow, Roxana, get yourself teaching legal in English. I've spoken many times before in these webinars about how my worst class I ever did was legal English. 
if that class had had Roxana, woohoo, they would have loved you. Um, right. Uh, so I would, right, so lots of stuff going on there. Uh, I would put somewhere in your profile um, that, well, I'd put my first, I don't know, Roxana, I don't know what your first language is. I, Malquasa sounds a bit Polish. First language, Polish, but I would also put native speaking level of English. Uh, proven through working for 10 years as a police constable in the UK. Something like that, okay? Uh, I, you know, if you've, if you've, I would read your CV and I would not have a problem with your English level. I would, you know, only an, an idiot recruiter would not see that you've got good English, okay? And I probably won't want to work for them. I hope that answers your question, Roxana. I think it does, doesn't it? Yeah, I think so. Good luck. Uh, Kiara, I've got to hurry up through these ones. Sorry, I'm babbling on a bit too much, Alan. Uh, good afternoon. Do companies tend to prefer online TEFL based qualifications or in person classroom based qualifications? Uh, right. So I, I think you know they're pretty, they're pretty much the same. Okay. Um, if you've got an online TEFL course, I, I, you know, you can get work out there. Okay. That that's the thing. You know, you don't need to do a CELTA. There are companies out there that want people with CELTAs, but they tend to be like the big, massive chains. And they sort of do it really just to sort of have a, a, a standard around there. But I don't, you don't need to do a CELTA, okay? You can do an online TEFL qualification with an, a classroom-based qualification. So if you want to do one of our courses, you could do the theory, then you could spend the weekend with someone like me doing a practical element and you can put that on your CV. I think that is the most valuable thing to do, Kiara, if, if that's what you fancy. And we do these courses all over the place, uh, Europe, America, the UK, all right? So that's what I would do. I, I Don't go for a CELTA straight away. Maybe do that one time in the future, but then you'll probably want to do a Delta. Okay, so I don't think so. All right. Uh, you don't need to do a CELTA. Yeah. John, age discrimination. All right. Did I discriminate? I don't think. Oh, you're not accusing me. I don't think you're right, John. No. You're almost 60. You've been out to teach for a while. Uh, no, not too long ago to matter. I'm not I'm not a problem. But the, the problem with the age discrimination is, uh, supposed age discrimination, is that countries put um, a limit on the work visa age. Europe is not a problem if you've got an EU passport. China, East Asia, that kind of thing. They have an upper limit for the visa. And the reason why they do it is for sort of healthcare reasons, that kind of thing. The UK do it for people coming to us. We give you less points if you're older. That kind of thing. So it's not really age discrimination. I guess it kind of is, could be seen as age discrimination, but it's not the companies, it's the countries that are doing that. Definitely put that on your CV though, for sure. Yeah. Uh, Karen, hello. Uh, you've taught in, you teach English literature, chemistry, and integrated science. How do you put that on your CV? So you'd have a, a you list of your qualifications, profile, work experience, um, secondary school teacher, uh, Belfast, two thousand and five to current, whatever it might be, and then I'd put it in bullet points what you teach. That sort of thing. And I'd go into a bit of detail: the types of English literature, the ages that you teach to, um, how many hours you've been teaching it, that kind of thing. That's what I would do, Karen, with that. Okay. Uh, Eli, hello. You've studied for a certificate in translation. Yep. Get a TEFL job for sure. Put that in your qualification section. Yep. That would be helpful again. But again, you might still need to prove your English. Okay. You might need to. Uh, Armin, hello. Um, what is your advice for non-native teachers, which is most difficult for them related to natives? So the number one... The not look, it's it's easier if you're a native speaker. It is. I'm afraid. I'm sorry. It is. Now it doesn't tend to be because there are people in the UK whose first language isn't English, but the the, the magic thing is that is the passport that helps you get the visa more easily. Um, and it's not really to do with your first language. It tends to be what passport you've got, just because that helps to get the visa. Um. I, most non-native speakers, I find, give up getting TEFL jobs quite easily. 
I this morning did a a, a chat. I had a, a Zoom chat with someone who was a Dutch person teaching in Vietnam. Yeah, and Holland isn't necessarily Netherlands isn't necessarily on the list of easy countries to get a visa for. But however, what he did for Vietnam for work visa. But what he did was he looked at the places where not everybody sort of wants to go to. So yeah, you know, China, everybody wants to go to Beijing. Everybody wants to go to Shanghai, Hong Kong. If you can work in some places which aren't as common, which aren't as touristy, the company might be more willing to help someone who is a non-native speaker. So I would look off the beaten track a little bit. I would also look at countries where they don't really care what passport you get to get the visa, somewhere like Cambodia. But I do find that non-native speakers, they, they tend to sort of think, oh, no, I can't get a job. I can't get a job. There are jobs out there, I promise for you. You've just got it might take a little bit longer than someone whizzing in with a British passport. OK, uh, Eli, you're about to teach a, a bunch of a group of grown ups. Those grown ups in your country whose English proficiency is rather low. Can it? Yes, 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 for sure. If you've got any experience, whether it's the beginner, hello, my name is Carl. You're teaching that right up to being able to debate about the merits of the human rights system in Azerbaijan. You know, anything on that scale from beginner up to advanced is fantastic. Put that on your CV. Thank you very much, everybody. Uh, that's going to be the end of it, I think. Yeah, I'm sorry if I did not get to your question, but I've run out of time. I'm really, really sorry. Thank you very much for staying with us. If you want more information, go to our website, which is tefl.org. OK, um, go to that. We've got a blog section. Click on that. Do a search for CV. Do a search for non-native speakers. You want to know about the different courses we do? There's a TEFL courses section. OK, there's a uh, if you get down to the bottom, there's a chat with us function, that kind of thing. Um, you can send us a message. We also have a Facebook page. You can we read all the messages on YouTube, LinkedIn, anything like that. OK, yeah, we've got a, a Facebook group. Definitely go on that. There's loads of people really helpful. I monitor that. I help. I answered the question last week. Um, so, you know, just 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 have a look at it. All right. Um, thank you very much. Uh, we've got loads of other videos like this as well from the past, okay, from the past sort of two years. Go back through, have a look at any like that. We're going to do some more coming up in the future. Cheers, everybody. Yeah, please like the video. If you didn't like it, please put in the chat that you didn't like it. I like reading those as much as I like reading the people saying that that was a good video. Thank you very much, everybody. Have a good day. Bye-bye.